my father was there when he made the historic flight down the road. He, he started the plane off and the propeller blew his hat off. It had such a force of wind. Grandad was the, the guy that swung the prop when uh, he did that first take off in 1903. He, he had this uh, this vision in his head that um, man could fly. Um, all the people around him said, no, that's not possible, and uh, it's um, very, much, very much against the nature of things to be flying. Um, birds are made to fly, but uh, man was uh, made to stay on the ground. Well, this is the road where Richard made the, his historical first flight. He started up the road quite a distance and of course it wasn't tar shield in those days, it was just a rough old cart track. It had gorse hedges 12 feet high either side and uh, eventually after taking off he crashed into one of the gorse hedges. Well, my father was uh, not uh, impressed with his attempt to fly. He, he uh, didn't think flying was possible. He thought that was for the birds. We want to commemorate 100 years of, of flight in New Zealand. Richard Pearce was said to have flown on the 31st of March uh, 1903 and we certainly hope to have the whole replica finished uh, ready for taxing trials prior to that date. The people in the States um, read the Wright Brothers aircraft um, they're laughing at us already because they know themselves and I think this has come from the people in New Zealand that obviously that it didn't happen. Um, they're stating that these guys in South Canterbury that were around in that time, that era, that it never ever happened. The extraordinary thing to me is that um, with all the evidence and the affidavits that have been um, gathered together about Richard's uh, experiments in flight, if you like, um, that uh, we're still in, a, in an age where there are doubters out there as to what he did and um, there are people that don't feel that he should be uh, recognised for anything other than being a bit of a tinkerer. There's a lot of things to be proven um, and none more so of course than the fact that, there you go guys, you know, the, the doubting Thomases, look at it, it's flying. And it'll fly. No two ways about it. It'll go. I read the books. Um, they stated that this thing um, just about shook itself to pieces and took off and ended up in a hedge. But um, and there's supposedly affidavits out there that say that this thing did fly. But um, I'm not convinced. Amos Martin was his name, he worked for my old dad, and he he saw him fly. Uh, Zach Connell was a massive guy, and, and uh, I'm told that by again by my father, he uh, used to hold a dray axle for ramming posts. Now a dray axle is a fairly big lump of steel, and he used to ram posts with one of those with one hand. He was a big, strong guy. But yeah, he helped Pierce get this plane into the air, so called, and, and uh, retrieve it from when it landed in the head. He said he was holding the rope. I thought the animal was holding the rope. And then it, it explained and took off. It landed in the gorse fits. It was a big thing too, wasn't it? There was a span of it. Yes, I must have knew they were going to take off that day. 
I think the schools, were, so the kids from the school was there, and a few people from the neighbours gathered up in there. And yes, there was, oh, there was a good crowd there that day, I think, to see the plane taken off. But there was no one to help him that with it that much. That was the trouble. He didn't get much help from people like what he had mentioned. That. He didn't get much help. People didn't, didn't go along with it at all. It was a wonderful thing that they could bring it to that stage. And cars and things were hardly thought of then yet, even. I can remember him telling that, that, it, that the plane took off and flew. I just heard him saying he was holding the rope and, and then the thing took off. It was a great achievement now, there for those days. Oh, they used to say he was sort of bedilly <laughs> to try to fly. Well, I remember my great auntie coming down to our place and talking about the old days and uh, talking about Richard Pearce flying his aeroplane. And uh, she said that she took the school children, she was a school teacher at the time, and she took the children up to watch him fly. And she said that he flew the aeroplane and it landed on top of this very high gorse fence, possibly about 12 or 14 foot high. People are coming up and telling me things which we haven't heard before. Just this week, um, I'm, involved in a, I'm involved in a club, and one of the ladies from this club came up and said to me, she said, when I was um, in my latter stages of schooling, the teacher took uh, myself and another girl aside one evening and said to us, um, look, I'm telling you something that I saw and I know to be true and I want to tell you this because in years to come um, there may be conflict over this. She said, I'm your school teacher and I was here and I saw Richard Pearce get into the air. Now these, these girls have never forgotten that because the teacher impressed, them, impressed it upon them so much. Now these little things are coming out all the time. Um, but at the same time, we are finding people who are great disbelievers in it, uh, and I don't think they have any more information than what we as a group have obtained, um, but they are taking a different viewpoint, um, uh, a knocker's view that it couldn't possibly have happened, um, and we have our view that we think it could have happened, and in fact it did happen, and that is giving us the motivation to carry on and, and press along and do what we're doing and we want to make something as close as we can to what Richard made and we're going to try our darndest to see if, if we can do what he did, or what we believe he did. There's people out there who are trying to change history, you know, 1903 to now and they still can't prove it. So I don't believe that they can actually prove it. Well, just looking at what um you know, what he had, what, what's documented and what's, what's uh, in drawings, um, that uh, he certainly achieved something all right. Now, the debate whether he actually flew when, he, when the people who remember where he flew, that's another debate again. But I have no doubt that uh, the machine was capable of flight. And he's he constantly reminded that, gee, you know, I'd hate to be sort of trying to achieve this with what he had at his disposal. I'm, when this thing starts rolling, how are we going to bloody stop it? It's going to be <laughs> a foot up here, isn't it? Yeah, no, I don't. Because, I mean, really, this is the track that Pierce must have gone down that hell of a lot of suck and see. It's a team effort. We're having some people who are building the engine and we've got others who are building the undercarriage and I've undertaken to build the airframe side of it. It was the last of these brackets for the wing ropes. It's all done. Yeah. So that's progress today, isn't it? It is. The, the tools that he had available would be very, very basic tools um, and I would think that uh, I know he had a forge um, because a lot of his um, uh, metal was fabricated by himself with a forge and a, and a big hammer. Most farmers would do most of their shotting or certainly if a shoe fell off they'd probably turn their hand to being a blacksmith and 
everything you did, you, you, you belted it with a big hammer around the forge. Basically, it was a pretty simple art, but um, well, well used. Uh, the, the real reason for recognising Richard Pierce more than anything else is, is just to have the concept of flight in his head and to actually de allow that concept to develop into um, physically building something that would fly or that would get off the ground. He had ideas um, that were far beyond what the Wright brothers had thought about and I mean they, were, they, were, they had a lot of help. Um, for a start off there was two of them trying to achieve the same goal. He had to adapt the steam principles or engineering technology as it was in those days to an internal combustion engine. So there again, not only are we talking about an aeroplane, we're talking about means of powering it. Um, because uh, that must have been an incredible, difficult journey for him. We're at the uh, 2002 Wanaka Air Show, and we've, um, we've, our prime exhibit will be the Pierce replica, which has kindly been loaned to us by Motat. There's no doubt about it, he's a very, very clever man. <laughs> you know, we've been playing around with aeroplanes now for well, nearly 100 years, and to think that he had none of the knowledge that, that we've amassed over that time, uh, and he nutted all this out himself, and, and we can't better a lot of the things that he did. We may slightly improve upon them, but not better them. Uh, full of admiration for Richard Pierce. By what we know now, we can judge whether we're going to get it and give it a go or not, and uh, which is something he didn't have the luxury of. I mean, we can take it at the point where we're thinking, well, this looks a bit dodgy, but we're going to sit in it and crank it up and just, just get it to the stage where it's almost flying and see how it feels. And at that point, if you've got any aviation blood in you, you'll know to get out of it quick or to carry on. Richard had designed something that uh, he knew was less than perfect. He didn't know it was going to fly. Um, and he didn't know whether he was going to live or he was going to die. I think he used bits of angle iron and uh, just sheets of um, uh, old um, windmill blades. Yeah, they probably were too, yeah. To actually yeah. fit on some of his props. Yeah. That he, he, he knew about windmills, which yeah, is something, right, yeah. you know, and they were very efficient. Just a matter of getting the drawings finished and start machining. It was a challenge to me and Lex, and we like a challenge and we were determined that we were going to make this motor which was rather unique in its construction and method and we were positive we could make it actually operate. His design is the most unique part of it though and to copy that design and make it work and to prove it worked is, is the one I want to do. What do I want to do? I really want to prove a point. That engine went and I'm going to prove it. The only downfall I see in the whole construction is probably the scotch yoke and the crank pin assembly. Uh, that's probably the weak link in the whole motor. We're def definitely going to make sure that this machine will work. We know that Pierce did have an aircraft engine going at some stage. Every night I think about one other part of this engine. Well, we've uh, gone another phase, put a few bits together and um, starting to look like a, a workable um, bit of kit, I think. That's three and a half degrees. That's about what we were happy with, wasn't it, Graham? But, um, he was determined he was going to make a, an aeroplane fly, and he, I'm sure when you look at this, which is close as we can get to his patent drawings, it will fly. We've now married the undercarriage to the centre section and uh, it's beginning to, to look like things are going to work for us. It now, because it is actually all held together with and sat back with our bits of tapes and string holding it together, you now sort of see, wow, this is, you know, this is a goer. We never stop thinking about it, dreaming about it. Well, it sort of, I got woken up part way through the whole thing, so it, it was one of those dreams that unfortunately didn't have it. Um, 
and fight land ending, but uh, that I had managed to get the, the replica flying. And it seems that the only thing that I'd done different was that I'd leaned back at the critical full song throttle stage, and because of the slight weight shift, had managed to get the nose wheel off the ground. And of course, from there on, she it was it was flying. And at that point, I was sort of getting the old elbow. <laughs> You're making funny noises. What's wrong? So it was basically the beginning and the end of it all. But um, yeah, I've, I've had the Richard Pearce airplane flying. So. And although it has good basic sound aerodynamic um, ring to it, as a dream, it's, I mean, maybe this will we have to do to get it off the ground, who knows. So they invited me along to bring along my engine and to show it to them. I was asked to come along and just uh, show you how much work I've done. As you know, it's, uh, it's all been made out of uh, scrap material and everything, but that's basically what it's going to look like. The bore is four inches if you're interested in the size of it, which is damn near as big as the boss on the front, so it's going to thump out a little bit of power. And they all just started clapping, and I was quite taken by that because I didn't know what was going to happen. Wonderful. That is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's not finished, but it's pretty well in working condition. And the fact that they all got up and crowded around it and had a good old look at it was what really pleased me the most. That, that was really good. It's a wonderful, wonderful piece of machinery. I can't wait to see how it goes. Do you think that the fuel tank will be enough for one or two circuits of the airfield? <laughs>